As Sena leaves the interview, she calls Hani. That was a waste of time. I'll never get the job. She tells him everything that happened, including the fact that Robert started the interview 30 minutes late and was the only person in the office dressed in a suit and tie. As she replays it to Hanny, she is convinced Robert was making a power play right from the start. Why else would he wear a dark suit and start the interview so late? She asks. He wanted to make it clear who the boss is, as if I don't know. That's crazy, Annie responds. He's the CFO, so that's why he's wearing a suit. And the African Americans are always late, just like your parents. It's a cultural thing. She knows her head covering is probably uncomfortable for potential employers. She wonders if she should have gone to the interview without it. Many of her Muslim friends back in Detroit haven't worn one since high school. They see it as very old school. But Sena doesn't feel like her hijab is a symbol of oppression. She actually feels more comfortable wearing it and it's better that an employer sees her with it now than surprising the company after she's hired. Meanwhile, Robert has the big meeting about the Middle Eastern acquisition in a couple of hours and there's no time to prepare. From reviewing all the reports they've received, it seems like working toward a win-win deal with this Middle Eastern company is a no-brainer. But Robert can't shake his fears from Sharon's story about the Singaporean who had to bribe his way into doing work in, Midi in the Middle East. Robert and his company pride themselves on their integrity and transparency. In fact, the U.S. Department of Justice just asked Robert to come represent the company at an antitrust summit they are doing in D.C. because of the company's exemplary practices. Robert decides, you know what, I'm a bottom line kind of guy, so they might as well know that about me now. I'm just going to tell them what Sharon told me and see how they respond. Their response alone will tell us volumes. If we are disclosing all our financials, the least they can do is respond to a concern about corrupt business practices. A week later, Robert has interviewed all the job candidates and it's clear Sena is the most qualified person for the job. Her references gave her rave reviews. She scored well on the assessments administered by the Human Resources Office and she demonstrates the needed balance between administrative capabilities and people. Robert is known for being a guy who makes decisions quickly. But this one is unusually hard for him. He calls her voicemail, hoping she won't pick up. She doesn't. He just wants to see if he can detect any foreign accent when she speaks. No, there's nothing about her voice on the recording that would indicate she isn't a native Midwesterner. It's not that Robert has anything against foreigners. After all, he married one. It's his clients he's worried about. They aren't as accepting as he is. He should know. He puts up with their racist comments and behavior all the time. His natural voice is loud and exuberant but he's learned to speak more quietly, lest people be fearful of a voiceless six foot two African American man in corporate finance. So what will his clients do if they show up at his office and see 
someone like Cena. Most of the people he deals with aren't going to know how to respond to someone who looks like her. Robert catches himself. What am I thinking? It seems like every week someone talks about how articulate and eloquent I am. He doesn't speak any differently than Joe, the CIO in the office next door. But Joe's white, so no one thinks to point out that he is articulate. Is Robert doing the very thing to Sena that has been done to him all his life by the good old boys? Robert refuses to discriminate. This is a moment of truth. He decides to hire Sena. He's going to ignore his, her ethnic and religious background and just treat her as a human being. He thinks no matter what we look like, we are all the same.